think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that because you've succeeded in the past, it's going to be easier this time. Leila Hermosi, the CEO of Acquisition.com, running a portfolio of over 16 companies, doing over $200 million a year in revenue. In most times when a company is not performing, we thought they were going to, we would like them to, et cetera. It's a conversation. It's not what are you doing wrong, it's what we want to do differently moving forward. Uh, one of my friends, anytime he tells me or gives me a suggestion, because I just, I do shit immediately. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, good idea, let's just do this. So for me, slowing down is the harder thing for me to do. Layla, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me, I appreciate it. Stoked to be here. Um, so yeah, kicking things off. You have a goal of getting from $100 million net worth to a billion, you're documenting the journey. You know, how do you feel like you're doing right now? Like, are you on track to that goal or what's kind of the current bottleneck in your universe? Yeah, it's an interesting question. Um, I tend to have long time horizons. Yeah. So in the projections that I laid out for acquisition.com, you know, it's funny, a lot of people were like, if you guys aren't at a billion in through two, three years, what are you fucking doing? You know? And I was like, I think a lot of people make the mistake of thinking that because you've succeeded in the past, it's going to be easier this time. And I think it's easier in that you know what to expect but I think it's harder in the, in the way that you expect it to be easier. And I really prepared myself for like, building businesses is a key strength of ours, but we are not investors. And so I think there's gonna be a learning curve. Mm -hmm. So I, I factored in grace time for myself in the first couple of years of like, we're probably gonna have to dial in our investment thesis. And so that's definitely happened. Um, it's changed a lot over the last two years. And I feel now much more confident in, you know, I would say like an investment thesis is equivalent to like product market fit yep. than I did two years ago when we started. Um, and it's professionalized a lot. And so I think, I do think we're on track. And I think, I feel like this is the most clear I felt about the business in, since we started it. Um, I actually took pretty much this last quarter to do a lot of thinking and reflecting. Actually, our last quarterly planning, we left without a plan because oh no yeah it was really interesting but you know the team brought some interesting stuff to the table and i am not the type of person that ever makes a decision on the spot or mm -hmm. surrounded by other people or when i'm tired and time constrained mm -hmm. um and then when i had a lot to think about i was like there's a lot of honestly i think we're overwhelmed with opportunity and so because of that it's really hard to decide like what opportunities do we want to capitalize on mm -hmm. um which is not a problem i've ever had and also one i prefer but it's a problem nonetheless. And so that was what I did for the last quarter. And I think I came out of it with a really clear plan for what needs to happen. Yeah. That's one thing I find over the years is that you, the approach to kind of an end of the year reflection, you know, and kind of like going deep on, you know, what's gone well, what hasn't, doing an energy audit, what stuff's giving you energy, draining your energy, the more kind of conscious of those things you can be yeah. and slow down going to the next year. Um, is yeah. something that I find, you know, when you do that right, you really get going into the next year that much stronger. And those years that you kind of just breeze over it or you rush it or you give yourself two days over the holidays to just kind of look at it, you kind of go into the year and you're sort of screwed. Yeah. I'm curious on your side, like what does your kind of quarterly review system look like on a personal level and then on a business level? And how's that like evolved over the years? Yeah, well, as you're saying that, I'm like, yeah, I'm really bad at that, man. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm so like, uh, one of my friends, he jokes that he worries about like anytime he tells me or gives me a suggestion because I just, I do shit immediately. Mm -hmm. Like I'm just like, let's yeah, I'm see the same if it way. works. Yeah, I'm like, yeah. okay, good idea. Let's just do this. I'm like, slow do down, right slow now. down, slow down. Right. <laughs> and um, so for me, slowing down is the harder thing for me to do. And I think, especially because I think I got to a good rhythm when we had gym launch. And then when we were selling it, there was so much strategic thinking time, time to reflect, and then when I got back in acquisition.com, I was like, holy crap, I'm back in like, it's me. I don't mm -hmm. have a team of a hundred people. And I had to switch gears, which was hard at first. Um, and I think now I've come to a point where I was just saying today, like I do my team a disservice and this business and everyone else who believes in us if I don't take more time to do these things right now. And I didn't do it last quarter because I was I was playing CFO. I like, I oh, really? retired. The new one didn't couldn't come for a couple months. It was oh, like no. a whole yeah, right. And so in the midst of the book launch, yeah, wow, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's some that's some real shit. Um, and so it was really like running on e. You know what I mean? And I think I did the business a disservice and probably set us back a couple months because I was not allocating my time properly. And 
I felt the pain of that. And so I was like, I can't do that again. So for me, what it looks like now is uh, one, you know, looking at going into the next quarter, I've dedicated myself like one day a week. I want, it's even hard to say a lot, like nothing on the calendar, which is like, if you see my calendar. Is that calendar, even possible? <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm going to try um, because I really think that right now what's needed is I need more time to reflect and also do deeper thinking work to help my team mm -hmm. step up. Like I have 10 leadership, you know, uh, roles that report to me. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've put enough time into them, to developing them, to reflecting on where I need to help them. Um, and I look at that as like one of my biggest areas of leverage. Also our businesses reflecting on where are we at the strategy on each one? Where can I help? Where can we adjust? Where are we, you know, remaining too stagnant? We need to change something. Where are we changing too much? It's just a lot of things I think require more thinking than the last businesses I ran. And so that's my, how I've been doing that. In my approach to the quarter, it starts usually, I mean, you probably know this too. It's like it yeah. starts six to eight weeks before the quarter ends, right? Yeah. It's like, all right, you know, looking at our 12, our three-year objectives and our 12-month objectives, you know, pressure testing, are these still the objectives? Mm -hmm. um, that starts, I would say, minimum six weeks ahead of time. And I run that through with the executive team. We're beating that up. And then I'm bringing that to the leadership team and pressure testing it again there. And then from there, looking at our progress towards our quarterly objectives as a company and as individuals and saying like, a lot of times I reflect on, are we even efficient? Like, are, are we even good at setting goals? You know, right. if too many people don't hit them or too many people hit them, then it's like, you know what I mean? The ratio is a little off. Um, I yeah. want to make sure that we're setting the right goals for the company. And then it's going into the plan with like, okay, if there are things that need to be reconsidered, I will wipe my calendar and I will dedicate time to just think and work through it. And a lot of that involves making phone calls, talking to people, calling advisors, mentors. Um, and if that's not, then I'm thinking, okay, we are on the right track, doing the right things. What else can we do to accelerate this? How can we get there faster? How can we get there in a way that creates more wins for more people. Like, how can we make it better? Yeah. I like to say, like, how can we upgrade what we're currently doing? Um, and then I like to put that to the team and ask them for their thoughts and get all of that, gather all the information. Um, I also survey the whole team and then take all of that in, digest it, and then bring it to the quarterly. Um, I'll be honest, it's a really different process than I even use with my last companies because um, I think that for a lot of the time that I ran a few of them, I only had a couple of people who were whose jobs were to think mm. and to develop strategy. And now I have a lot of people who are able to do that and whose insight I want on multiple levels of the company. And so it's different. And I've been vocal with the company about how I have to adjust how I operate to accommodate it. Yeah. It sounds like we're very similar. It's like you get into the next opportunity and like you're saying, like you think it's going to get easier and sure enough, like you end up amping it up a bunch. Yeah. You know, you want to like push the envelope more, whatever extra bit of energy or comfort you have now that you've kind yeah. of been around the block. You're like, all right, well, I got to make up for that by doubling the discomfort in some area yeah. or another. And I think it's our job as we yeah, enter a new year, kind of asking our team and asking ourselves, like, how can we just push that little bit more? Because yeah. you kind of like, you play that out over the long term. And, you know, you're getting two, three years of accelerated progress if you can just every quarter just be cranking it up. Yeah. Just a little bit more. On 100%. your side, like what's the areas that you're kind of looking at your team to kind of like, hey, is it more content? Is it growing the audience bigger? Is it more deal flow? Is it the types of deals you're doing? Like what are the areas right now that you're like, these are the levers that we really need to throttle more? There's a couple. I would say that when it comes to acquisition.com, okay, I would say there's a problem with your question itself, which is the one that I plan to tackle this year, which is that people see Alex and Layla and acquisition.com as one entity. And I've, I realized that I was growing and so was Alex frustrated with that perception. And so one of my large initiatives this year is to separate those entities. Okay. Acquisition.com, Alex actually has far less to do with it than I think people recognize. Okay. But because his brand is so prominent, obviously he's involved in the strategy mm. and all that. But like the day-to-day -day and a lot of the things that we're doing now, it's much more me and the team. And we've okay. had this conversation and said like how... Because I think that people see Alex think acquisition.com. And I think that Alex has so many other things that he's going to be pursuing hmm. that it doesn't make sense 
to also have him so tied closely with acquisition.com. I'm kind of shocked hearing you say this. I, didn't, oh, really? I, I had no idea that this was the case. I think most people don't. Um, okay. It's probably the first time I've said it too. So the way I see it is that acquisition.com, Alex is going to make more associations with other things. Oh, cool. And Layla only is going to associate with acquisition.com. Okay. Because I am only going to do one thing. I'm not, Alex and I are different that way. Like I mm-hmm. want one thing I want to focus on. He likes to have multiple things. And I think we can facilitate that environment. We've, and he knows that that's always been the goal. Um, but in order for that to make a lot of sense, there has to be more of me associated with acquisition.com, which means I also need to make more content because I don't. I, I prioritize acquisition.com, my team, Alex, Alex's brand above everything I do for myself because um, I've never seen the need. But now when I understand, what, now that I understand brand and associations, I see that I need to associate more with acquisition.com. Alex doesn't need to associate less. He just also needs to associate with these other things that he's going to be announcing in the next 30 days. Nice. And so that's the first piece is I want my team and acquisition.com to become its own brand. And I want it to be, and I have an entire plan for how I want to do that with them and how I want to create the team of acquisition.com and acquisition.com as its own entity is strong. It doesn't right. need Alex and Layla because it is, that's the reality. Mm-hmm. But it's not reflected on the outer in the outer world. And so that's my first initiative from a brand standpoint. That starts with, we are separating our content teams so there's going to be Alex, Layla, and then there's going to be acquisition.com. Okay. And right now we're making a lot of progress for the Alex and Layla because we've been sharing. And then we're going to be bringing in people for the acquisition.com as soon as like these two are separate. That's the first piece. The second piece is, I think for acquisition.com, it's looking at what companies can we add the most value to, but they we can also get the most value from. There's a lot of companies that we can add a an absorbent amount of value to, but the return on effort for us mm. is very low over a long enough time horizon. Right. So I can take a company and it can go from, you know, 3 million to 25 million. And then I guess we can sell it. And then because we're minority and then we get, and then it's, I have a whole team and it, okay, well, if we did that with a company that was five times the size, what would the return on effort be? Right. And so... Yeah, you back it out and your hourly rates is not what you're looking for. Exactly. Um, and so I think right now what I've seen is that there is an opportunity for us to help smaller businesses and larger ones by acquiring platform companies and then using those platform companies to acquire companies below them. That's because awesome. Because what we built with yeah. you know our last company was a platform company. We understood what that looked like. We know what to look for in those and we understand a lot of the verticals that are adjacent to what we built and a lot of our deal flow is the nodes. And so... That's my focus right now is what are our next two platform companies? And I want to have those acquisitions done by the end of 2024, but I only want two because they're big. Um, And I want to, like the whole thesis has gone into less and deeper. So it's like we want to have less companies and we want to go deeper on the ones that we do have. I'm going through a little bit of a similar challenge with Founder West right now. You know, I built Mm -hmm. up Founder West as a community and a platform kind of starting off largely off my own personal brand. Yeah, And so it was kind of building that up and then building the reputation around Founder US as kind of an ancillary part of, oh, Matt does this other thing. Yeah, And then there comes a certain point where you kind of want that thing just to you know, live it's onto on. itself by itself. And it's a, I think it's a tricky like middle process. It's kind of like that, you know, uh, the middle journey of anything. Like people sometimes like end up forgetting about it, but in the middle, it's a bit sticky. Yeah. You know, and like, like you're in that pace right now where it's like, oh yeah, like Alex is doing this and I'm doing that. Like this will... No, you'll look back in 10 years and everyone's going to know acquisition.com of the, as like the Berkshire of its area, you know, but this right. is just that kind of messy middle right. of the journey where it's like, oh yeah, we're just trying to disassociate ourselves from that right now. How do you kind of yeah. plan on, you know, ensuring that's a smooth transition? Like what is the vision for acquisition.com? Like from a brand standpoint, is it like a Berkshire of its area or is it, yeah, how do you look at that? Um, I think there's a couple of things, which is one in terms of ensuring the transition is smooth. The way that I did it in Gym Launch was instead of, you know, Alex was the primary face of Gym Launch. Instead of saying, I'm going to remove Alex, I just said, I'm going to keep Alex as involved as he is and mm-hmm. add in other people. Yeah, that's what I'm doing too. It's just like get other instructors, start to make this kind of like founder school essentially. Yes. And then basically they're getting a bonus because they're getting more of other things. And so, you know, I look at it right now as like the first piece is like, um, 
you know, I think to accurately display my involvement with acquisition.com on all of the materials on the website, on things like that, um, in the videos. And so we're going towards more of Layla being more heavily associated first, but not taking Alex out of anything, just having an equal distribution of that. And then I have a plan for basically content capture for the whole team so we can get much more content of the people that are on our leadership team, executive team. And then I envision it as for those who want it and it makes sense, you know, they will have, they will start to be personalities that can ascend and they can, the group of us are what make up acquisition.com, you know? Um, cool. Yeah. In a weird way, it kind of reminds me of almost like a barstool of sports. And just in terms of yeah. like the fact that they have all these different personalities behind yeah. this kind of brand that all do their own shtick, you know? Yeah. Like you could have like the content guy with Caleb and then have more diligencing type people that are just good at that or so on totally. and so forth. And I think... It's funny because we've been approached multiple times for like, we want to do a TV show. And they've like interviewed some of our team and like, they're like, dude, the, everyone could be on TV. Here. Like, because a lot of people have really cool personalities, you know, they're super yeah. funny, super animated, whatever. And we're like, yeah, but then we would have to like have a TV show and that kind of sounds like it would suck. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But it gave me the idea. And I was like, you know, our team, I think a lot of them are not just really good at their jobs, but I think naturally, maybe it's just like the kind of personalities I'm drawn to. I think have great personalities that I think would draw in a lot of people. And I think, the times when people do meet our team, they're like, holy shit, these people are so smart. And I'm like, yeah, I'm telling you, they're smarter than me. You know what I mean? But it's just like, if you don't have access to that, then, you know, perception is reality. So yeah, that's the piece of the smooth transition that I think um, I feel really good about. Just adding more of me and then more of the team. Right. Yeah, so essentially like, yeah, he keeps on going at his rate, but in terms of the overall distribution of content, he just makes up, even at his current capacity of content he's releasing, it's still just like 15%. Now mm-hmm. of the total, you know, yeah. high of content coming out from acquisition.com versus, you know, you, you rewind two years, he was maybe 60, 70, 80% of it. So that, maybe. yeah. And then he has a really large deal that he's been securing a partnership. And so he's going to also be a part of another company. Nice. And so I think he's going to be having content come out that's going to be in relation to that company that he's really excited about. And I am as well. Nice. Um and I think that will then also show like, I think a lot of what reality is, which is like, he has a lot of other things happening and going on. Yeah. And so when you look at the platform side of things, you know, it's really interesting. And I think there's like massive sort of network effects and different sort of like long-term leverage you're looking to build with that. It seems like you're kind of, yeah, initially was looking to acquire different, you know, the first six months, you know, whether it's digital products, e-learning type businesses, ed tech, yeah. and obviously you've kind of gone you know, upstream, like what's bigger than that? Or let's actually acquire platforms and then roll these, like you say, nodes into them. Yeah. What are the criteria that you're looking for then in these platforms? Like, are we talking like the next Kajabi type platform then that these guys would actually put their courses and stuff on? Or how do you kind of look at that? Or is it payment platforms or? Yeah, really interesting. So when I say platform, I mean a business that is a platform business uh, for private equity means that it could facilitate acquisitions beneath it. Mm. So for us, we have chosen the niche of brick and mortar. Um, you know, we have gone really f- away besides a couple of companies, uh, I would say like two that are still in the portfolio that are of our old niche that I think have, are even trans- transforming into businesses that are not like business education. Um, but the difficulty with those businesses, I'll just say is like, um, they are, when you buy a business that is, small, less than 5 million in EBITDA, it is more dependent on the founder than the business. And you probably know this, like once the business is, you know, let's say it's doing 10 or 15 million EBITDA, you can take the founder out and the business still runs. Mm -hmm. And so we're a minority partner. We partnered with people who had smaller businesses. The businesses were more dependent on them. We don't have control over some of the things they're doing. We say, we think this is what makes the most sense. They choose to ignore it tank the business doesn't take too many of those for me to say, fuck this. (laughs) (laughs) Like that was a very punishing event. I would like to avoid that in the future. Um, And so for me, especially when you're so heavily invested, not just in that capital, but just the amount of time and the advice and the agony. And then to see all of that just go to waste. You're like, Oh my gosh. Oh, and dude, like, and the thing is, is like, I think it's funny. Like we were talking about, I was like, man, I, I always have the mentality. It's like, I'm going to give so much more than they're ever going to expect. And I'm going to, and then it's like, And then I'm like, what are you doing? You just tank the business. Like after two years of pouring your fucking heart and soul. And like, I can't do anything, you know, because I'm, I don't, I didn't protect myself enough. Right. And, 
and you know, I think I also, I just, I was ignorant going into it, you know, with some of the first, um, you know, times we did it, I didn't think, I thought more about them than about myself during the deal. Mm -hmm. And I think I've come to realize that there's a lot of dynamics at play that I'm just never going to be able to mitigate no matter like how good of a person I think I am or like how pure my intentions are, like how much I really help them. Um, I think that it's it's just tough if you're a minority partner. Mm -hmm. And I think that going into it, so much has changed that makes that very difficult for us. Um, specifically having notoriety. Like it was a problem for some people. Like as Alex started to gain specifically him, like really blow up his brand, it didn't sit well with some people. With the portfolio goes? Mm -hmm. What part of that would not go well? I feel like maybe the part that wouldn't is that he's maybe not promoting them <laughs> while he's growing or what would be the part that would be off-putting? Or I guess he's more focused on himself than the businesses would be the person. I don't know. I think like, people say whatever they're going to say. Right. But, you know, what people I gather- People are going to talk and gather some issue well, one way or another if they want to. What I gather from it is that makes him less relatable to them. Hmm. Uh, maybe brings out insecurities. Yeah. Um, you know, and and so I talked to people, friends of mine that are famous investors. And I was like, has this? And they were like, oh yeah. Are you kidding me? You didn't know. And I was like, oh my God. You know, because when we first started it, like it wasn't, like we were super well known. And so that as well as now, I think there's much more, many more people looking at what we're doing. Um, we realize that our brand is a huge advantage and I would like to have companies that I really want to promote my, like showcase that these are companies mm -hmm. I love and I'm invested in. But if you do that with a company and it 5X is their company, okay, well, if I only own a minority stake and then you also don't do these things and then you fuck it up for all these customers I sent your way. So a lot of things have led me to the conclusion and our portfolio companies know this, that now we're just looking for platform companies where they've already proven that the company is a viable company. They have a good track record. They're stable. Um, they're not dependent on a founder um, and that we can take majority of because I don't feel comfortable putting our brand behind something I don't have complete control over. I just don't. And that's just a preference of mine. I'm probably just like too much of a control freak. I'm just like, yeah. if there's, because for me, it's like the worst fear is that we promote a company and there's a terrible customer experience. Like that, I just can't sit with, you know? Um, even during the book launch, you know, there was stuff that happened with like FedEx that was like outside of our control. But like, then they're like, fuck you, acquisition.com. And I'm like, oh my God, it's FedEx. But like, you just feel awful, you know? And yeah, it's yeah. like, I never want that. So that has changed a lot of how I look at acquiring businesses and, I think that it also, when you're buying a platform company, it makes it a really clean deal because they want money and I want the business. And in a minority, it's like, I want help to grow. What do you define as help? Mm -hmm. And I want you to And also, to help. why don't you know how to grow? Like there's right. a whole, like- what, And what, also, you know. are you going to be compliant with my recommendations? Right. And there's a lot of things that are tough in that, yeah. arena that it's like it's worked out really well for a few but it also feels punishing when it doesn't work out and so i realize i'm really good at running companies and our team is really good at running companies and we should just buy them and run them yeah and so yeah. it's really interesting to hear kind of in a way like the dark side of you know growing these things and growing an audience and you know a level of like fame if you want to call it or just notoriety or whatever um you know i think a lot of people like you don't see that on the surface, you know, like on the surface, like everything looks like it's going well. The book launch looks like it's going smooth. <sighs> the acquisitions seem like, yeah, it's coming along. Like you're being super selective of the 40,000 people that have applied. You've done your 18 deals or so, like things are moving along, but there's always like, yeah, just an underbelly to all this stuff. And I've dealt with the same stuff. Like, you know, you're just yeah. posting content online, you're helping people, no big deal. But in the background, one thing's going on or someone's yeah. complaining about this or, hey, that's my thing or whatever, right? Like there's totally. always some some stuff, you know, well, how do you kind of deal with that? Like yourself? Like, I think we all on the surface, it's easy to say, oh, you know, we have thick skin. It's nothing. You know, you just learn not to give a fuck about what people think. But like, I'm curious on your side, like, how do you kind of... I just think everyone's bullshitting mm -hmm. and that nobody tells the truth and nobody talks about how hard business is. And I actually just like really feel motivated by like, I try to do the vlogs and I try to make content where I'm talking about like the shit that sucks and is hard because... Every friend of mine that is like multi-billionaire, whatever, worth billion, like 
they're like, fuck these people. That they look at people and like they don't even have a real fucking business. Like they can because they're like they wouldn't be that. Like it's not that easy. Mm -hmm. And I think it's for me. I'm just say, speaking the truth, stating the facts, yeah. and that's all I'm ever going to do. I think there's a few things which is for me. I, I don't think ethically I could make business content without talking about how hard it still is for me, mm -hmm. um, because I think that that is. I think it's a fallacy. I also think think that that's not good for people to think that they're going to get to some point where business is easy. It's just not true. Yeah. And I would feel really badly if people watched my content and thought that was what was going to happen. Yeah. Like I wouldn't feel good about that. I want people to watch my content and it makes their life better in the short term and the long term. Right. I completely kind of resonate with too. Like, you know, like every time a new solution comes up or a new milestone you hit, there's always like, well, then the next challenge, right? Like, delegating a certain part or finding that right pyre or like as you're growing, yeah. everything's going well, but then your CFO leaves randomly and now suddenly you're taking everything on. So yeah, it's about painting that real picture because yeah, the realness of it is that it doesn't really get any easier. If anything, you kind of keep on going after bigger and bigger challenges. Hopefully you're more skilled and more capable as you grow, but there's still, you know, horrible days and horrible things that go on. Yeah. Uh, so I'll tell you how I cope with that is I think just absolute pure acceptance. There's mm -hmm. this meme that I joke and I send to Alex all the time. And it's like, uh, someone goes to hand a guy uh, like pills and alcohol. He goes, no, like my drug of choice is suffering. <laughs> um, and I relate to that so much because like, I, I don't do anything to cope. I just like accept that it's going to be really hard and painful at times. Yeah. And for me, I used to resist feeling frustrated, upset, angry, anxious, depressed, whatever it was for the with, within the context of what was happening in the business. And it made it so much harder because I was constantly fighting with reality. Mm -hmm. And it just like, as much as I fought with it, it never changed. You yeah. know what I mean? I just felt worse. Yeah. And as soon as I just accepted and just kind of like, I don't know, I have this like visual of myself just like bathing in the, the shit of it. <laughs> like not actually bathing in shit, that sounds awful. But like just like immersing <laughs> myself into water. And that's like the bad feelings are the water. And I just yeah. like let myself fall into it it just feels so much easier. I'm just yeah. like, this sucks. And I accept that it sucks. And it goes away so much faster that way. Yeah. I still find I have like that instinctual reaction when something goes wrong. I'm just like, what the fuck? How's this happening right now? But oh, yeah, when yeah, you kind of, of finally, 48 hours, hopefully cool down a bit, you're like, all right, I'm going to be better off because of this. I just got to accept what's going on, accept these circumstances. Let's just put the action plan together and like move forward from this. But totally. it's I mean, tricky. And it, I mean, it, it really, I think beyond just making it easier, I think with just the sheer amount of decisions going on and portfolio companies you have and the stuff that we're both doing, it almost becomes a requirement if you're going to stay in the game. It's like, or else yeah. you just have way too much shit going on that you care way too much about. You just won't survive. Oh, dude, you're like a ball of stress if you do that. Yeah. And, and yeah, I think it's just, I never want to be that. I totally agree. I think it's like, you just won't make it. You'll, yeah. you'll opt out is what you'll do. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's what happens. People people get to the point where it's like they do care too deeply about too many things and then they opt out. They're like, the business drove me to drink or the business drove me to this and and so I had to quit. And I'm like, or you could have just dealt with mm -hmm. how you manage your feelings and your thoughts. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so I think a lot of it starts with that. It's like, what's our relationship with how we're feeling and our relationship with the thoughts we're having about our business? And if you can come to terms and be at peace with both of those things, I think it makes it much easier. Yeah, no, it's definitely one of those things where I think, yeah, as you kind of continue to grow, you realize that the sort of cap or the lid to your success is like your own ability to like lead yourself and manage your own feelings, manage your mind, manage your, you know, your way of kind of, yeah, dealing with things because there's going to be bad situations and bad things that come up and you just can't let it get you down for too long. You got to kind of bounce back. I know, there's so many. On your team <laughs> side of things, like, you know, obviously as you've been scaling things out, you've been building an amazing team around you. You have like 10 people you mentioned that report to you, what are sort of the key traits that you're looking for in these people? And out of like, when you think of maybe a couple of the kind of star performers on the team, what's like the stuff that you're like, these are the kind of traits that I didn't know about maybe when I was starting, but these are the things that like I need to be looking for. Like I know on my side, something that we've recently kind of characterized as like producer energy. People that just like, they always figure out a way. Not the kind of people that come back to you and need to check in or get your opinion on things. Generally, like you can just give them some ambiguous task. And they're going to just find a way to get that thing yeah. done. And we just call it producer energy. And we kind of look to hire for that now. I'm curious on your yeah, side, like if there's any mm -hmm. traits you've seen. I would say that, you know, I try to reflect the traits in our values. Um, so I'll kind of break down what I think the values, I would say like the traits that compile them. Like one that I would say for me, that's really important is I call it competitive greatness. 
And what I mean by that is, you know, when we first started this acquisition.com, it was from a place of, you know, are we going to invest in real estate? Are we going to just put our money in stocks? Are we just going to like, you know, just hang out for the next few years? Like, you know, go to island. Like, we don't need to keep working. We're, we can just live off what we've got. And it was like, dude, that's just like not in our blood. <laughs> like, that's not who I am. Like, I like the challenge. Like, I've been like that my whole life. And I truly enjoy it more than I don't enjoy it. And I was like, I only want to be surrounded by people like that. Like I want people who are not just here for the money. Like they're here because they are hungry for the challenge and the growth that comes with the position. Mm. And so I think that one of the most important things to me is that I hire people where I know that money is not the first thought. That's really important to me. Yeah. Because I don't think that they can, I mean, money's great, but it's not my first thought, which might be surprising, but it's not. Um, I have to train myself to balance like, the different sides, because sometimes I actually can think too little of it, um, mm -hmm. which is probably sounds like bullshit, but like, it's just, it's just been how I have been my whole life, probably how I was brought up. Um, and so I want people who embodying personal excellence is their first thought. And then I think that the rest follows from there and competitive greatness, in my opinion, is like the epitome of that. Um, so that's the first thing I would look for. I think the second thing is that I, I do want people who are receptive to feedback. I think people who can, and this is something I think I'm actually good at. Um, and so people might think, oh, you're saying that because you're their boss. But no, I think I'm actually really good at this, which is like, when I have been made aware of something that I could do differently that would have a better result, I will change on a dime. Mm -hmm. I am able to quickly change my behavior. And I actually would say that that is a measure of intelligence. How quickly can we change our behavior once we realize that it is adverse to our goals? Yeah. And so I look for people who can quickly change behavior um, because I think that sometimes there's nothing harder, you probably know this, than working with people and having to time and time again. And, you know, I can help them more, but like, do I have the time to coach Sally every day, every yeah. week on this thing? Or worse than that, like you feel like you need to sugarcoat stuff because they take it personally or something when right. you're trying to just be open with them about just some standard stuff that we just need to get better at. Exactly. People who feedback is normalized and welcome. Mm -hmm. And I think we have a great culture of that where people can casually ask for feedback and it can be a conversation even at a lunch table with us. You know what I mean? Which is really cool. Um, and then I would say the last one is industriousness. Like I say this and oh God, I've had so many videos, but being able to work really hard on the right things. Mm -hmm. And there's not one, like actually, there's not one person on our team who would not work nights and weekends to get something done. I mean, there's only like 30 people. Like, I am sure of it. I've seen them all do it and not brag about it, not have to like whatever. They will be rewarded for it. Like people will shout them out. People will give them kudos. We'll like send them something, you know, like it's not like it goes unnoticed, but they don't do it because of that. They do it because that's who they are. And I think, you know, people who are, I like to say like, <laughs> this is like actually I'm like down motherfuckers. Yeah. Like they're just a down motherfucker. Like that's yeah. what I want, you know, because I'm a down motherfucker. I'm like, what do we got to do? I'm like, let's fucking do it. Yeah. Let's go. You know what I mean? And like, yeah. almost like take the stuff that many might complain about and turn it into something that's like a really cool challenge we get to go through together. Yeah. Yeah. I say like, if I'm running a team and it feels right, it should feel almost like a sports team. Yeah. And that we're just playing a game together versus like anyone yes. being too sensitive around anything. It's like, if you're playing basketball and someone missed an alley-oop, you just call them out. Like, who cares? Yeah, right. Like, no exactly. one's taking it personally. It's like, you fucked up. Let's just be real and let's get back out and like keep crushing. Let's not get hung up on like a bit of feedback or, totally. and let's just like be comfortable with just like, we're all going to make mistakes, but we're going to be forthright when it happens. And inevitably let's just operate like a meritocracy and just get better because of it and change our minds if there's a better idea that didn't come from us, you know? And that should just mm -hmm. be standard. But I feel like we live in a lot of, there's a lot of soft people out there. And I know. A lot of easy, you know, it becomes easy, I think. If you don't hire right, you start allowing a little bit of that to seep in your company. And I've been guilty yeah. of that in the past. And then you're just like, oh my God, what kind of culture am I running right now? Yeah, then you don't want to be in your own oh, company. Oh no, it's the worst. You've basically built a prison. Yeah. I um, had that a decade ago in something I built. So I did too. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's the worst feeling On, on the your world. side, like how are you testing people for something like competitive greatness? Because we all want to say, you know, we're just hiring great people in it. You know, but you make mistakes, especially early on in your career. You know, is there a couple things like, you know, I've learned over the years to, you know, put really like, almost have like anti-interviews where I'm not going to give you challenges and things to do oftentimes that you're only going to do this stuff if you really want this job. And yeah. it can't be because of the money or nothing. Like 
it may just be some inconvenient shit in a certain role That's that fair. maybe requires that in like an operational role that if you can hump, you know, jump over these sort of things, yeah. then you're serious about what we're about to do. I'm curious on your side, how does that look like for you? What kind of stuff have you integrated into your recruitment, your hiring processes to screen for competitive greatness? So that's definitely one. Um, you know, I would say like even for like Jason is here because we did uh, video editor tryouts and it was like... You passed. Right. <laughs> and it go. was basically, we gave them footage and we gave them a very short time span that they had to meet the requirements and turn the footage in. Nice. And dude, it was crazy. Cause like, I think this was like a year and a half ago ish. Um, I think a thousand people signed up for the tryouts and then the ones who made it through and actually turned it in on time was like 48. And I was like, that's insane. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Um, and so through a lot of different roles, like when they're, they're roles that we can put those things into place, I think the harder ones for me are the higher level executives because it's much more strategic thinking, thought work. Those I look for in the interview process throughout all their interviews because I'll watch all of them. Um, I listened for what they speak of from their prior roles and why they want to come here. So the best people, I've seen a pattern, which is that typically they are not able to maximize their potential in their current role. So it's not that they hate the job they're at. They're like, this is a great place. I have a great boss. I have great, I just, I, I can't fully utilize my skill set here. And they recognize that the role at our company, they would be able to fully utilize their skill set. They would have more, um, which I think is where people, they get more reinforcement from that, right? Because right. if you're able to do all the things that you're best at, you feel great. Mm -hmm. You're getting to do all these things that you're like, I'm good at all of this and I like all of it and I have variety as well. And so I've noticed that as like the reason that they're leaving, it's never because the job is awful. It's because it does not maximize their skill set. The second is that, especially in a leadership role, they are walking away from money. So I have had multiple people where like they have a payout coming. It's coming in, you know, three or four months. They don't even ask, would you wait? They're like, at the end, when everything is said and done, they're like, just so you know, I really, really am excited for this job. I'm so excited that I just walked away from like a seven-figure payday. Hmm. So that tells me they're not short-term minded. Yeah, they're and, all in. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're competitively great. Mm -hmm. um, and then I would say that the last piece is when they talk about in all the interviews what they're excited about, and you can sense the excitement, it's the people they're going to be around and the cause that we're going after being so big. And I think a common theme that I realize is that people are like, I want this to be my career making move. I want this to be my gym launch, my stamp, you know, to show like I'm a fucking badass. So like none of it is about money and they even sacrifice money to get the role. Yeah, That to me from a higher level is how I measure it. From the lower level, I think it's inconvenient tasks is a fantastic way. No, it reminds me of the Jeff Bezos approach of just like hiring missionaries over mercenaries, right? Like people that are just down for the cause that, yeah, will quit, you know, a higher paying thing just to be around great people headed yeah. towards a great spot and are just committed to it. You know, those are the kind of people that, yeah, will go the distance in good times and in bad times versus yeah. ditch you in bad times because, you know, the financials don't look so good for a month or two or whatever it may be. And you need those people, yeah. like you said, that are just down motherfuckers. Yeah, just down motherfuckers. And I think it's actually super... Uh, common for us to encounter that because so many people like they see acquisition.com and they come from like traditional private equity or consulting or whatever it might be. And I'm not going to pay what they pay over there. Like mm -hmm. it makes no sense because especially like acquisition.com, like we get our own deal flow. Mm -hmm. A huge component of some of those giant companies is they're bringing in deals. And I'm like, okay, well you don't source deals at all here. So why would I pay you a million dollars a year? Right. And the right people recognize how much easier their jobs are because of the brand and because of the way the company is built as well, which I think is really important because I think that the best people don't just recognize their strengths, but also the strengths of the company they're walking into and they can contextualize like what their value is because of that. Yeah. I don't know if you've noticed that, but it's like the more experienced talent that you find and usually the better people, um, they're able to contextualize their value to the company based on what the company is, what their skill set is, and like the circumstances. Yeah. And Versus, ideally you're hiring people too with like a proven track record, maybe yeah. a proven track record building something bigger than what you've built yeah. so far. So you're kind of hoping that person can kind of repeat that playbook totally. at your existing company. So you'd hope that they're able to kind of look at the machine and go, okay, I see where this is at. I'm going to put 
you know, my playbook here, run my system there. And we're going to take yeah. this thing from this cute little operation you got right now to something amazing once I've kind of, you know, implemented my playbook. Yeah. Yeah. And can kind of see, yeah, obviously like the direction, the impact that's going to have the ROI and then know and kind of believe in that bigger vision to where it's headed. Yeah. And I think specific playbooks for sure. But I think, um, I'm like, I have to make sure that yeah. <laughs> we're on the right track, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so kind of shifting gears, you know, when you're looking at kind of acquiring this platform company over the next bit, when you look at, say, you know, a company, like what kind of revenue range are you thinking this company is going to be at that you'd go after? Um, it could be anywhere from 25 to 50. And then what would be the playbook that you'd take for something like that to get it to like 200 million? Oh, gosh. Well, if it's brick and mortar, there's fairly simple ways to do it. Um, the advantage that we have is that that's our, like, uh, and butter. where we have the most industry knowledge is brick and mortar. Mm -hmm. And that's something that it took us uh, the last couple of years to realize. Um, goodness, there's a lot of things that you can do. God, they're so simple. Um, so I would say that there's a few. One is you'd say, okay, how do I reach the organic what we call is like the organic max for this business, which is like if I take a business that's at, that's at 25 million and I want to get to 50, that's probably doable through uh, adding additional marketing channels, adding uh, increasing lifetime value through additional products and upsells, um, you know, uh, expanding profit margin through renegotiating with vendors and getting on different platforms, buying a technology that we integrate into the company. Those are all things that we could do to get towards organic max. And then it's fairly rinse and repeat from there on out, which is like, okay, now that I have a platform company for these brick and mortars, I'm going to acquire nodes with, uh, beneath them. And then that's how you expand to uh, increase the size of the company is that rather than starting these companies from within, you're just acquiring them. So like for us, for example, like a, an example of how this would work is like, um, if we wanted a platform for a med spa chain, then we would find as somebody who has, say, th uh, anywhere four to six locations, because med spas are typically high in revenue, like anywhere between, they might be per location on the lower end, like three or four million, and on the higher end, like eight million a year, mm -hmm. 10 million a year I've even seen per location. So say somebody has, let's just say four of them, and then they have a corporate team with a corporate headquarters, and they have quality control. They have head of CS. They have basically an executive team that oversees all these locations. Well, I go and buy that company. I improve it the best I can as its own entity. And then I say, cool, now we're just going to run the playbook, but we're just going to buy the locations to add on. So you've got four. Let's now our inbound flow, we get, you know, what is, I mean, maybe we get like 50 med spas a month that apply. Let's let, I'll tell all of them, do you want to be part of this other company? Right. And then when we sell, eventually it will be more valuable for you because you'll be worth more because you get a higher multiple because there's more of them. Right. And so that's, the expansion for brick and mortar um, and then the advantage that we have that I think is the unique advantage is that our ability to recruit operators for locations. Mm. So my plan is that once we get these platform companies, like one thing that we have a huge advantage at right now is our talent recruitment. Like our ability to get talent right now for our companies is like better than it's ever been for any of my own companies. And nice. it's because of the brand. Right. And it's not by like people applying on the site. It's by outbound. And so oh, we really? built... Uh -huh. Okay, so you're going and just reaching out to people and just kind of have like a talent list that you're going Yeah, after. so I, I look at our portfolio companies and then we, what are the roles that are open? Okay, what are the competitive companies that are ideal wow. where I think I can get the best talent? And then, you know, a brand, people answer. Brand yeah, exactly. Yeah, people answer. It's not that the brand attracts that talent. It's that the brand allows people to open the door when we yep. knock. And so finding the talent, I believe that a huge advantage to scaling... The operations is that um, I would love to use like my brand to find operators, you know, and train and put through an operator training for these platform companies so that we can expand faster. Because if we look at the rollups that are done and then the current existing like chains, you could say where people have like 10 to 20 locations, like what is the, I would say like point of failure they're not good at recruiting talent at the pace they need to, to expand the company. Right. And that is what we we have so many people on our talent list yep. inbound and we have tons of people out down there answering. It's like, what do I do with all this excess? And so it's like, I want to put it into something that becomes more valuable if I put it in. And so that's another way is that um, just our ability to recruit the talent for the companies needed. I think it's, I think it's highly leveraged in that opportunity because it's not just that I'm bringing in teammates for them, but I'm bringing in operators who run locations. 
Does that make right. sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the thing that people often overlook as you're building a brand. Like people think about, oh, it's going to be easier to raise investment, easier to close deals, more uh, surface area for luck or building a community. Uh, and the often overlooked thing is your ability to go and actually attract clients. Oh, sorry, attract talent. Yeah. And be able to open different doors there is like insane. And Dude, I think that's like, like the number one thing. The reality is that you can just build, bring in really smart people that know what they're doing. And if your brand, whether it's your personal brand, your business brand can open up a lot of doors and bring them into an industry where maybe the talent's gotten a little stagnant overall. Yeah. You, know, you can have a huge competitive advantage. Oh, a hundred percent. And I know it's hard though, because like for someone who's listening to this, that's never experienced that it's not real and it's not valuable. Right. You know, to people who have larger businesses who have had a bad person, replaced them with a great one and seen increase in revenue and profit, they're like, holy shit, it's the holy grail. And that's one piece that I haven't yet figured out how to get through to smaller businesses. Yeah. I think sometimes it's also just like the cost of a bad hire. Like they may not understand all the time, like the benefit of a good hire. It's sort of maybe hard to imagine like someone that comes on board your business or transforms it seems almost too good to be true. Yeah. But I think all of us have felt the pain of like that person that comes in, it's screws so some things wrong. up, runs some weird systems, yeah. upsets some clients. And you're like, wow, we are back, you know, 10 Square months of where one. we should have been, you know, and you can feel no. that and just go, at least if I could just find someone that just kept this ship rolling. Yeah. Like, we'd be a lot better anything. off. <laughs> totally. On your side, like as you've kind of, you know, when you think about getting from, you know, hundred million now to a bill, what are some of like the core systems that you think that need to like evolve inside of your business, you know, to get to that level? Uh, the number one right now, and that I foresee is uh, data. Data. Yeah. I've yeah. been feeling the same thing. Like I was talking to our team on some team meetings right now, and it's like dashboards, data, understanding full funnel tracking, like just the smarter you are, the better decisions you can make. Yes. Um, I think with everything, it's like data, reporting, and operational cadence. And I think if you upgrade your vision, you have to upgrade your operations. And that's the thing that consistently has to upgrade. Um, I need to upgrade it now. I'm going to need to continue to upgrade it. Um, I'll be honest, like IT and uh, I would say like the IT side of things of like putting together dashboard. That's, oh my God, I just fucking hate it. Like if there's one thing that you know, but I'm always like, why would I do that? You know what I mean? But I don't even think I'm good at, uh, I don't even think it's like an area where I'm super skilled in, I, I'm just good at picking the person and that's pretty mm -hmm. much it. Yeah. Uh, so I think that that is an area. The second area I would say, I just think it's going to be a cultural shift. I think that, I mean, I've seen it before in the business and I, I'll see it again, but with on a smaller scale because there's less people needed for acquisition.com to grow. I think that some people aren't going to like when we require more discipline of data, reporting, operational cadence, transparency, documentation, because the job changes a lot for them. Um, and I think that's a, it's a cultural shift and it's a hard one to make because for somebody who was there when that stuff wasn't needed, it just feels like you have now made their job harder. And unless you can properly articulate the benefit, direct benefit to them, not just the business, it's hard to keep people as engaged as you grow when it just feels like for them in their world, they just have more work to do that is less valuable, that gets them no reward. And that's not something, that's something I feel is a challenge that I can take on and we'll think through. And I feel like I can come up with some creative ways to make it uh, easier. But there's also just like the practicalities of like business is not perfect and some parts of it are going to be less fun than others. And so I think as any company goes from like, you know, anyone going from like a hundred million to a billion, like there's just has to be a much higher level of discipline around some of those things. Um, you know, but that's also why, like, I think the thought of being a public CEO to me sounds awful. I don't, there's a certain level where you're like, I'm good. <laughs> it seems like some unnecessary pain. Yeah, exactly. I was watching a recent uh, video you had out and you were talking about the importance of like understanding different efficiency metrics. And one of them was your revenue per uh, employee. Yeah. Is there any other kind of metrics you look at as, you know, how efficient your portfolio companies are? I look at the correlation between their ability to complete their initiatives that they commit to and their growth as a company. And so are those initiatives tracked like via like the OKRs and such? And like they set out these quarterly objectives or annual objectives yeah, and how many of those did they hit? call them whatever you want. Yeah. But I have noticed, well, there there is a correlation between our companies that grow the fastest and have the best profit margins and those that hit their quarterly objectives. Right. 
And so we track that. So that is something that I pay a lot of close attention to. I would say that the next piece is quality of hire, which is a two-way fit, which is like 90 days in. Um, do they both agree this is the right fit? And I think our best companies are put a lot more emphasis on getting the right talent and playing their part in that. And I think that we have a huge hand in that with them. But the ones who succeed the most take initiative there um, and make sure that they are creating great experience for the talent that we place in the company. And then I would say, looking at, in terms of what we use to measure the success, it's interesting because like, the f- obviously revenue, profit, uh, we track sales and marketing metrics for all of them. Uh, CS, like backend, uh, I would say, oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> the LTV of customers. Right. And so um, just looking at referral metrics, you know, lifetime value, like all that to me just tells you how sticky is their revenue mm-hmm. and how likely is it that they're going to have the same revenue this month that they did last month. Um which some of them have amazing metrics and some of them, they're just younger and less mature in that area. Um, ten, companies tend to master sales and marketing and then say, oh yeah, we got to make sure, you know. And, you know, when we come in, we're like, no, you could do much less sales and marketing and be much more efficient if you, you know, paid attention to these things on the back end. Um, and I think that's just probably by the nature of our content, some of the companies that have been attracted to us. Um, more sales and marketing heavy just because like Alex, that's what he talks about more. Yeah. Um, so that, yeah, I would say it's interesting because it's, it's, it's a holistic measurement. I think that also, you know, one that's really interesting for me, that's probably is we have the CEOs rate themselves each quarter. Okay. And And what does that rating system look like? uh, I actually took a similar one to what I would have my executives rate themselves. Okay. And then uh, combined it with like a few ones from that I've seen like boards use for rating CEOs. And basically there's a values portion and then there's a like hard met, like these are, was your job. How did you line up metrics, et cetera. And the best companies rate themselves worse, the founders and the CEOs and the worst companies. Oh, they think that they underperformed, but they did better. Yeah. So they're just really hard on themselves. Yes. And then the worst companies overrate themselves. Right. And so <laughs> that to me is very fascinating. Um, and so when we first bring someone on, based on how they rate themselves tells me a lot because I do think that the best founders, they're not up their own ass. You know what I mean? Like they they always think that they have places to improve and if anything, they're probably a little too hard on themselves. For sure. And so, you know, across all the companies, across all the hires that you have, there's obviously a bunch of sticky situations. You know, you talk a lot about, you know, praise over punishment, but I'm curious, like, how does that intersect? Like when someone's just not doing well, you know, and they've set out some goals and they're not tracking towards it. And it's not the first quarter this happened. Maybe they're on their second now and it's kind of a last chance. Like, how are you dealing with the accountability around that? And then, you know, how does that fit into the frame of like pursuing praise versus punishment? Yeah. Um, so I think that there's a difference between punishment and consequences. Okay. If somebody doesn't do their job, they will eventually be fired. Right. That's a consequence of not doing your job. Versus if I wanted to punish this person, I would yell at them, threaten them. Mm. I would purposely try to make them feel bad. And I consider punishment to be much more purposely trying to make someone feel bad in a way that changes their behavior in the short term, but doesn't help you in the long term. And so with the companies, for example, I like to, like we always say, like state the facts, like this happened. I color it with none of my opinion. Like last quarter, we only met 50% to quota. What do you think of that? And like legitimately, that is what I do with all of the situations right now, uh, with my own team, with the portfolio companies. I state the facts of what happened and I first ask them what they think. Yeah. Because honestly, I don't I can't even think of a time in the last six months that somebody hasn't said what I already was thinking. And now I don't have to say anything that feels punishing to them. They bring up to me what they think happened and where they went wrong. And then I get to be the one that helps them. Right. I hear you. You know what? Maybe we could do this. And it becomes a collaboration and it feels much more like a team effort rather than me coming down upon them. So it's similar to like, I think how a marriage works, which is like, if your spouse does something that is adverse to the relationship, you know, me and Alex just be like, well, what do you think of that? And we'll be like, well, I think I fucking was being an idiot. 
and actually this and that. And it's like, okay, cool. Is there anything I can do to help so that next time we do it this way instead? So it's like you become a positive because you get to help. You become the hand that pulls them up rather than like the one that's swatting them down. Yeah. And so I think that that's my approach to most all situations. Now, um, in most times when a company is not performing how we thought they were going to, we would like them to, et cetera, um, it's a conversation. How do you think this is going? What do you think we could be doing better, et cetera? Um, and then we allow them, you know, when we are trying to give feedback because there are places where it makes sense, then it's, it's, it's not what are you doing wrong it's what we want to do differently moving forward. Yeah. So I think it's just a different frame because if you tell, tell someone what they're doing wrong, you give them no direction. You just make them feel bad. But if you tell them what you would like them to do differently moving forward, they can visualize what they need to go do now. And so I always say like, do you want to make someone feel bad or do you want them to do something differently? Right. Very different objectives. And it's kind of like when you watch bosses give advice to people and you hear them say like, well, you're just really mean to your coworkers. So just like stop being mean okay, like, what the fuck am I going to do with that? Mm -hmm. You know, like, how helpful is that advice? You know, there's no direction. You just know that you did something bad. You feel bad now. You don't like your boss. And how do you stop being mean? You know what I mean? People get very vague. Like, it's just, there's nothing someone can do. Yeah, there's nothing them. tangible about there's it. nothing tangible. And so with our companies, I strive really hard to just, what can we do differently going forward? And they often are incredibly receptive to that. And I think most of the times, like, people are already so much harder on themselves than anybody else could be on them that any amount of telling someone that, that they did something badly or wrong, or, they already know. You know, there's nobody that's gotten through our vetting process that wouldn't already know. You know, and then the one person that maybe that's happened, we're not with them anymore, so. <laughs> you know, I think that's one of the more underrated traits too as a leader is like just being curious, you know, versus going to people and being, yeah, put in that position where, you know, you have some feedback and it's just constantly you kind of raining down on people. Yeah, It's like, just bring up the facts, like you're saying, and kind of then switch it around just to being curious about what they think about the situation and what we can do next time. So you're both kind of opening up a conversation around it versus it being a one way. It's and so then true. talking about like a future orientation versus like just talking about past stuff. Like, what, what are we going to do now? The shit has happened. Let's lay the facts on the table and let's yeah. just problem solve together as a squad and move forward here. Yeah, no, I, I, I completely agree with that. I think it's um always choosing curiosity over judgment. Mm -hmm. and it's funny you know our our portfolio operating partner he's the person who like manages the portfolio companies like first like in command uh that's the one thing that it's funny everyone says they like every time i talk to him i leave feeling better than i was before yeah it's because he's so good at just asking questions with this tone of curiosity and never accusing anybody of anything nice yeah in terms of your immediate circle around you and your companies, like, you know, it's a, it's a lot. Like you, you're managing a lot of stuff and you're not just, you know, it's not just the portfolio. You got the content side and we were talking just before this, you're saying you're amping that up even more. How do you kind of manage all this? Like what's the team around you? Like chief of staff, an operations person? Like who's kind of, how many EAs do we have? Like what's, what yeah. does this look like? Yeah, you know, I think about an interesting point where I have to, I realized probably two weeks ago that I need to change it um, because I think I have, 10 direct reports now. Which is like, like probably two to four too many. Yeah, it's, I would prefer to have, to elevate a few more people to have less, but it's at a weird transition point. So I think that that might be a quarter or two away. Um, Right now, in terms of how I manage it, I mean, I have, obviously, I have an admin team of three um, and that is very helpful, but I'm like, how do I feel like I need another one? Uh, I would say that like my, so one is that my EA, she's been with me for six and a half years. Nice. And she's our senior executive assistant. She has two people that report to her. So that makes up the admin team. Okay. And then on the other side, you know, I have uh, a CFO and obviously um, he's incredibly proficient and, you know, he's somebody I brought in as like, I need you to completely own this stuff. And like, it's not, it's not like I'm training him on his job at all, which is like, Great. It's a very autonomous role. Uh, the rest of the roles in the company, I would say on the leadership team, you know, uh, marketing and sales. Um, so we have an interesting how the team is structured right now. We have someone who's over the portfolio. We have a head of people. We have a head of marketing. We have a, a director of content. We have a head of business development and the CFO. And at the same time, for some of those roles, they also will help in the portfolio. So they manage our internal function of that, 
but they also will help in the portfolio companies at times. Some of them, like three of them out of right. the seven. And so it's interesting because, because we're at this point where it's like, there's not enough work for some of them in the portfolio to full-time be doing that. They're also doing a split. So right now, some of them, it's becoming too much. And so I have to bring, I have to split it. I have to say, you're internal. Now we need to bring in mm -hmm. someone who's external. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's like, I have to then you're have- You're open sourcing your team to some extent to your portfolio companies, but Correct. at some juncture, they're almost pulling too much from Correct. them. So it's like, okay, we just got to focus you. You're either working on the portfolio companies, you're working for corporate. Yes. So it's now those people I'm saying, for a couple of them, hire this person underneath of you. So we have a few of these open recs that once those happen, then those people can take more from my plate. So I think usually a lot of times, like right now, I'm like, okay, how do I, I know that I have probably too much on my plate in terms of, I believe my most, the things I should focus on are the things that are going to grow the company and the companies, right? Anything that is not, even if I'm very good at it, which is a lot of things that are operational, it doesn't make sense for me to be doing anymore. And so I say, the first thing before I say, like, oh, I need to hire someone is I'm looking at who on my team that if I elevated and I gave 10% of my work to, would it be a growth opportunity, a career opportunity for them? And it would relieve me. So that's the first thing I'm looking at right now. And I've identified a couple of people and had those conversations and they're excited, I'm excited, but they have to get people underneath them first. Um, so it's interesting. I think that what it looks like right now, what it's going to look like in a year are going to have to be very different. So you've got this EA trio underneath you. Yeah. What's, what's kind of like, what's that unit doing? Because I mean, I think there's a lot, like that's a lot of things. Like, first off, I think too many founders actually get help in that capacity way too late. I was just talking to a guy that's doing like $35 million a year and just hired an EA. And I'm like, what have you been doing all along? Like you didn't have like travel being booked or so anything. You just, you just, I mean, good on you, I guess. But yeah. I mean, at a certain point, you got to think that that's just better to delegate. 100%. You've obviously got three going there. Like what's kind of, how does that division of labor, like what's the, what's the secret there to getting yeah. that unit operating? I would say one is that you have to fucking love them all. Mm -hmm. Like, I mean, that sounds ridiculous, but like, Anyone that works within close proximity to me, it is an absolute requirement that I really like working with them. Yeah. I don't like settle on that at all. Because yeah, you and basically that, need to mind meld with these people, yeah. right? And if you got to be around them that much and yes. you know, their your brain needs to become theirs and vice versa, like yeah. you got to enjoy your time. You know, I think uh, Caleb the other day was saying, he's like, they're like your hype women. <laughs> I have these like late and they're like, you fucking go girl. You look fucking great today. Let's take a picture. <laughs> like just like such, so supportive, so awesome. Like I tell people- Shout out to the hype woman. Yeah, shout out to the hype woman. Uh, you know, I tell people, I'm like, all day, if you're a founder or a CEO, people are bringing you bad news. They're often bringing you problems. They're often yeah. bringing you things that they're dealing with. And you are supporting everybody else. You need somebody to support you. And so I look at them as like, that's my support unit. Um, and so I would say like the way division of labor, it's a little bit different. So we tried like divide, like you only do this, 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 and this. We actually have done much better with, we have a project management tool and we basically there's a queue and then my senior EA will source from the queue out to like who's going to do this work based on what their load is. Okay. And so most everyone could do everyone's job, which makes it much easier when one of them wants to like go on vacation or something. So only three of them. Mm -hmm. um, now in terms of the things that they're doing, we have building management, we have house management, we have travel management, we have podcast event management, we have... Uh, helping with a lot of legal and finance management personally and professionally because it's tied to me and Alex. So like that all has to happen. It's so like my assistant can go through an entire mortgage process. She can you know, do all the paperwork. She can do an investment for us. I mean, like she can do all of that. Um, and the other ones I think are learning, you know, meeting management, help managing vendors and other uh, on the team. I think they also do a lot of the management of the systems in our business and, uh, kind of act as like a first point of contact for the team when they need something so that it's not coming to me. And I think that they're constantly trying to take things off my plate and tell me where I could be more efficient if they don't think I need to be doing something. Um, they do all of our personal stuff as well. So like we don't have a dedicated personal assistant. They book all of my personal things. They take care of, you know, they make sure that the person that cleans our house also stocks the fridge. They make sure, you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so uh, literally everything. I joke. I'm like, you could ruin my fucking life if you wanted to. <laughs> and I love it. I don't care. I completely trust all, honestly, all of them. Like I, I think you have to. I don't, yeah. they could drain my bank account tomorrow yeah, if they yeah. want to. 
No, I think that's the blocker that a lot of CEOs have with this is that they're like, well, I'm going to give them access to my bank account. I'm going to give them access to my phone and all this kind of stuff or email, whatever it is. And then that yeah. prevents them from just getting that additional leverage and time back. But it's like, yeah, just find someone that you trust and get rid of this stuff so that, yeah, get your email taken care of, get your messages taken care of, whatever it may be, just to get that time back. Yeah. And, you know, that peace of mind. I think it is hard too, though, because like there are some people who great EAs don't want to work for. Hmm. You know what I mean? Because they're not fun to be around. Right. And then, and then those EAs, Maybe they're not, they're not going to stick around long because it's such a punishing thing because so many founders, like you get one step too close and it's like, they're just a ticking time bomb. You right. know what I mean? I've seen a lot of that and I've heard a lot of it from EAs um, in the interview processes. <laughs> um, yeah. And so I think I always am also trying to think like, how am I adding value to their lives? Right. You know, like I always am going to say, thank you so much. Smiley face, exclamation mark. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Like at the end of the day, I'm saying like, Hey, I just want to tell you how grateful I am for you. Thank you for doing this thing, going above and beyond, giving them thumbs up. Like always trying to just like, you know, when one of them's at my house and maybe we have an extra second, I'm like, you want to go on a walk? Like, you know, we do fun team stuff. I mean, I just think it's a, it's a two-way street. Yeah. You know, if you want that person to go above and beyond for you, you have to do it for them. Yeah. You know, like I genuinely get excited thinking about like, what Christmas present am I going to get them? You know what I mean? Because like they deserve it. They're fucking awesome. You yeah. know? So... Yeah, you want to be a positive energy exchange, especially if you're going to be spending that much time, like make it something that's, you know, you're having a great, you got a great squad. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's not like, just something where it's like, yeah, you're just asking this person not, repeatedly for stuff. They're not like your slave or some 100%. shit. It's like, no, make it a fun relationship and grow together. Make it good for everyone. Yeah, and I would say like, they are, uh, we have a very professional relationship, but I also consider them friends, mm -hmm. which is weird, but they would say the same thing. Like friends, family, whatever you want to say it, like there is a, familial bond I have with them that is probably because we spend so much time together that I actually have love for them. And do you feel like that's the same with the rest of your team or is this just like a unique thing to that squad? I think you have to have a certain level of proximity. Yeah. I definitely have it for other people on the team yeah. that I have the proximity with. Right. And it's, I think that, you know, me and Alex talked about like, you spend enough time from some, with someone, you start to love them like family. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, I would never say that to anybody out loud, by the way, <laughs> HR fucking compliant. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's true, you know what I mean? And I do I think the only role that I probably speak openly about those things is like with an EA. I I just think if you really want that person to if you really want to get the best from that person, like I just think it's I've seen too many people have to fire great EAs because they just aren't friendly enough with them. Right. You know, and I think you're exposing every ounce of your personal life to this person, at least for them to be super like to for them to really do their job, you do. Um and that's hard to do if it's not somebody that you would openly give those things to because you just like like them as a person. Yeah. So I don't know. I definitely think that that is something that now that I'm speaking to it, it's like, I, I if one of them goes out of town, it's like, I never, you know, it's not like I tell them like, oh my God, like, I'm so sad you're gone. But I'm like, motherfucker, when are they back? <laughs> because like, they really do help me do everything. Yeah. So shifting from the people engine of the business to the media engine, you guys obviously have some massive plans there. My understanding is you guys just bought a big production studio. Is that right? So we bought a large building. A building. Okay. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, I don't know, 10 minutes from here. Um, but yeah, it's like a 38,000 square foot building. So we go in like competing with Mr. Beast at this point? What's what's going on? <laughs> yeah, me. No, I'm the opposite of that. <laughs> um, no, I, you know, Alex and I have different ideas for our content. And as we get separate teams, it's going to look different. But the idea was we want to make it as easy as possible to make content. Okay. Because it's not something that when, for me, I don't want it to detract from what I'm already doing. I want it to be integrated as much as possible. So it's like, where are areas that we can do content that make it easy? It's like, well, if I had a studio and Alex had a studio, it was all set up. Then when I have an hour gap between meetings, we can just throw in a recording session yep. and throw in a podcast. Uh, if we had our own gym, people could just record us. We talk about this like between sets and just like have a conversation between sets, like it's recorded. And so if we create, you know, build this building, which we have and it's under construction and we create all these things within it. That's exciting. That, yeah, 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 yeah. And that helps us facilitate content in a way that works for us and doesn't deter from the things that we're doing on a daily basis that move the business forward. Yeah, I put that on my dream list for uh, next year. I don't think it'll be on the scale that you guys are doing, obviously. But yeah, just get a nice studio, make it yeah. easy. It's just so much better than having to constantly, yeah, just rent audible it constantly. Travel, yeah, yeah. Because yeah. you, you guys been doing that up until now. Is like renting the studios all the time and everything. Uh, renting studios, and we would just like do it in our house. Like, well, 
And that that also just becomes because like Alex I had no Wolf, idea. I thought you guys had like a, a decent operation like on that side or a decent setup going. You have an amazing operation. No, no, no. But uh, no, I didn't, didn't realize. I, okay, wow. No, we were like doing it out of our house. And it was like, I don't know. Alex and I are like really scrappy. Uh, we're like, fuck it, do it out of our house. You know what I mean? Like we don't care. But then it was like, okay, we have a condo. And <laughs> now Alex is recording on days when Layla's not. She's working. And then Layla can hear him through the wall when she's on the meeting. And she's like, shut the fuck up. Yeah, me and, and my girlfriend like, have that right now. And I, I feel for her. It's yeah, like, let's get this then, guy out of my house. I was, what's this guy doing? Yeah. And then he's like, don't come in. I'm making a video. I don't want you to hear it. You know, like, we're just like, <laughs> dude, no. I'm naked right now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, and neither of us really like want the other to be like watching while we're making content. Yeah. He's the only person I care thinks about it. So yeah, yeah. it's awkward person. that way. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, why we're building that out. And because I would like to, I, I believe that we will be better at the content if more of the team is in person, the people editing the content, the people producing the content. I think that if we have an in-person environment, it's the one department that I feel like has much more of an advantage and it makes way more sense and will make their jobs easier if they're in person doing it rather than remote. And which side of the business do you think is going to be bigger in the next decade? The media side of the business or the acquisition side? I think that's a really tough one. There's a lot of opportunities in media that we pass up on a consistent basis. And it's just because the business is just not at a point where I think that makes sense and it would sacrifice it. And at the end of the day, like I want to be, I want to have a business. I like having a business. I like running a business. Making content is fun. And I like that it helps people a lot. I don't know if I would enjoy it as much if I didn't also run a business. You know, and that's what I do 95% of the time. So, but it's a really, honest, honestly, it's kind of where I feel consistently torn. Um, and I don't really think I have a good answer just because it's something I personally struggle with. I've had two meetings in the last month where people who are very famous and very wise and that I look up to have told me, have presented opportunities and been like, you need to go all in on this, kind of more like Alex's. And it makes me like really uncomfortable. <laughs> right. So I, yeah, I got to figure what, it doesn't matter why it makes me uncomfortable. I think I'm still going to commit to doing more of it. Um, but I don't know what level I would take it to. I would never, okay, let me put it like this. I've created a business where I have the flexibility that like I can grow this business and create this business in a way that I think there's an environment where it like makes my life better. I think that there's a certain level of media and content where if it goes beyond the scope of acquisition.com having control of it, say if we were to go like mainstream media or sign with some companies and such, um, I would lose control and lose some autonomy. And I just don't know if I'd be willing to do that. Right. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And I mean, there's only so much of your life you want to open up and so much stuff you want to put on the ta table and you want to have control of what's out there. You don't want to suddenly give up control it, yeah, and then uh, have someone else dictating. Time. Right. It's of my time. So there's a lot of deals out there that maybe have been presented to us, but like then I lose autonomy of time. Right. And that- and That's what you work so hard for yeah, over these years like, is just being able to at least dictate right. what the hell you're going to do with your days and weeks. Right. And I like, I'm pretty good at suffering, but I'm like, I don't know. I feel like, it, like, I don't know if that would be conducive with the rest of the goals I have. So that's that's a place where I feel torn. Um and I think it's yet to be determined. I think we'll see how the year goes. I'd like the direction we're going now. I've already gone from like, all right, doing like one day a month to like one day a week. That's a huge jump for me. So we'll see. And if you don't mind me asking, like what's the other part that makes you uncomfortable with that? Like in terms of, you know, it's interesting that you have a level of discomfort with it, but you kind of keep doing it. And in despite of that, you've yeah. kind of still ramped it up. Yeah. What's the discomfort there and how have you kind of rationalized? Well, even despite that, I'm going to go further. Is it the leverage from it or... No, um, I think it's that in my mind, mentally, I've just always fo focused on Alex's brand, like because his brand was the face of our last company. And then when we started acquisition.com, it was like, that was first going to be like, his brand is associated with acquisition.com. And so I do a lot behind the scenes to facilitate those things and lead a lot of the things that, you know, make that easy for him. It feels like in a weird way, me focusing on mine I just don't want it to, I don't like feeling like I put less focus on his or I, I give less support to it in any way. Interesting. Um, which I don't think has to do with business as much as it does being married. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah. Like as his wife, I love being like a supporter and making it easy for him, all those things. Like I don't, I don't like lose that just because we're business partners. Um, right. That's true. And so in my mind, it's like, okay, now I'm prioritizing mine. Like I don't want to, 
I don't want something to become a negative for him. Right. But he is, listen, Alex is the first person to fucking tell me I need to fucking pay attention to my brand. Yeah. Like, a guy came to me a month ago and he was like, dude, you need, you, if you just fucking thought about your brand, he's like, it would just like, um, it would probably grow the same piece as mine, but you put no thought into it. You don't even try. And I'm like, fuck. And he's like, I really think you should. He's the first person to tell me. And I'm still like, in. Eh. <laughs> so I, I feel like there's a large part of it though, as you continue to build it out. And if you got like, whatever you want to call it, more committed, more aggressive, or just more frequent with it, you'd just be going down the wormhole yourself while he's also going down that yeah. sort of path of mastery yeah. and developing it, not just as a, you know, not on the support side, but actually in the limelight and going through whatever the struggles, the learnings, the challenges are. And there's a greater degree that the further you go down that path of mastery, actually, you might actually be a better support for him. In a way. You sound like him. He always tries to find yeah, a way yeah. to make I, it. He actually like, paid me to say here's, that. <laughs> yeah. Here's why it would actually make you better at that. Yeah. yeah. No, I know. He like mind fucks me into, you know, doing what's best for me. Uh, no, I, I agree. I think you're right. I think it's all bullshit, honestly. Nice. And so as you kind of approach the the new year, um, any kind of core, you know, traits or skills you're looking to pick up to kind of get to that next level? Yes. I think sometimes when I'm talking, because I'm, I have the habit of not wanting to offend people. I'm too passive in how I speak. And I would like to practice being more direct in a way that's direct without being punishing. Because I think my fear is I'm going to sound like a bitch. <laughs> that's all. And I think my voice, my demeanor, all these things contribute to like, sometimes I watch my content, I'm like, a little tough there. Um, but I think that there's a difference between um, being rude or coming off with an arrogant tone when you're being direct and being direct in a way that gives people more clarity when they watch your content. And I think that one thing that I see that Alex is so good at, probably because he's written, I mean, he spent so many hours writing and studying language, is the way in which he can direct people with his words. And I would like to get better at that, not just for content, but for my company, is to speak in a way, in conditions, where I feel people are judging me or are having thoughts of uncertainty or are feeling you know, not just super stoked. I would like to be able to speak in a way that is more direct, in a way that can give them more clarity. And that's something that I think is a skill deficiency that I see between myself and him. I mean, not to mention other things I would say that would be in the content piece, but I think that is one that I can gain a lot both within my company and within content if I work on it. And how are you kind of going about picking up that skill? Because it's, it's tricky. I mean, I'm kind of also like a very passionate, intense person. And if I'm not too careful, it kind of can come across yeah, maybe a little overly aggressive versus yeah. you kind of got to dial it back a bit and be a bit conscious. Like, how do you kind of approach that development? My plan is to identify the situations in which it happens most frequently and then write one to two sentence script that I'm going to start saying every time. Hmm. It sounds silly, but I was speaking to one of my friends. He's a behavior, behavioral psychologist, whatever. And I was like, are there any books that I could read that would help me? He's like, that would just fucking confuse you. He's like, just just write yourself a damn script, two sentences. And mm. I was like, oh my God, that is so simple. And I can absolutely think of something. So that's my plan. I think that even like, I think that like sometimes I speak with less certainty because I don't want to offend people. And so I think, I think that changing that and speaking in a more direct manner will I think help people when they watch the content be more likely to take action because they have more clarity and have people in my team will feel I think the more clarity you can provide to your team, the more at ease they feel, the more action they'll take. Yeah. And then it's like safer for you too. You just know that there's a certain prompt or line that you can start something off with. Yeah. And know like, okay, I'm going to say this and I'm just going to shoot it straight and I can feel safe just to express myself clearly without feeling like I'm going to offend someone or come across the wrong way. Right. Exactly. Yeah. What about you for 2024? I'm curious. Uh, for me, I mean, on the personal side, I've been traveling for about a decade now. Um, so, wow. uh, living out of a suitcase basically for 10 years since selling my first business. So, uh, I'm going to be settling down and slowing down Damn. and getting a studio and I'm moving to Dubai. Holy uh, shit. So that's a pretty big move and everything. So you excited. Uh, yeah. I'm looking forward to it. I'm really excited. Yeah. To finally like have a, have a spot. Um, for me, it's a lot of, I think my biggest thing is balance of like, I get so like obsessive in the workspace and just like, you know, just building the craft and mastery balance and relationships can be something that like is tricky and yeah. finding what does balance mean? It doesn't, you know, it doesn't need any one thing to one couple, you know? Yeah, yeah. And kind of trying to find that, yeah, that right way of looking at it. And I don't think we've found that yet, like the common language around balance yet. So mm. 
yeah, I, I think it's still kind of foggy, but I'm, I'm, how do you, how have you kind of navigated that side of things? Just found someone who's obsessed with the same yeah, shit. That's what I was gonna say. That's what it, that's what it feels like. I'm like, okay, that's one that's one way of doing it. Yeah, I know. Yeah. I'm like, you just both want to talk we just about both it always all the time. Work. Yeah, we both always want to work and then talk about work. So it worked out. Yeah. So yeah. yeah, no, I'm kind of in something where yeah, it's more about yeah, not that not that, but in its own way, it's beautiful. So got to try to figure oh, out 100%. that balance side of things in a way that works for everyone. So that's definitely the growth opportunity, and I. I can't figure out what that is yet. I don't know if it's whether like we agree on a common calendar of like, okay, it's not exactly how much I'd work, but it's dialed back a bit and then leave some room for stuff. But then I don't know, that kind of was also ruins a bit of the intimacy. So I don't know. We'll see. Gotta yeah, figure that out. Uh, have you, have you heard of Esther Perel? You probably have. Yeah. I've yeah did, her, her name keeps coming up like every really? day. I think it's a sign. <laughs> um, her book, Mating in Captivity. It was one of the best books on relationships that I read. Okay. Now there's some weird shit in there. I don't endorse that, <laughs> but um, I, I don't. I don't die with all of it. But um, there was a piece about basically distance and closeness that I think gave such a fantastic frame for any relationship. It changed our relationship for the better forever. And what so, was the big kind of takeaway? Understanding that basically, when you are too close to the person, you start to feel like brother and sister, and you don't want to be intimate with them and you're too far for the person, you start to feel insecure, uncertain, uh, and you start to feel like unstable in the relationship. And so it talks about how it's not a problem to solve, but a dichotomy to be managed. Hmm. And it gave a lot of great language for us to use with each other around describing when we felt like we were too close. And it took it away from being like a bad thing and made it in, I think the book normalized it. That's cool. And so we could talk about and like, even like we both bring it up sometimes the same day. I'm like, dude, I feel like we're like on top of each other all day. And like, I just like need some, I just need alone time. He's like, dude, I'm so sick of seeing your face. We like joke about it. I was like, yeah, I know yeah. I'm fucking sick of seeing you too. All right, well, I'm going to go for like three hours. We're like, bye. And we were just like disappear for the you know, half day. Yeah. And then at the other time, you know, like even in the last few months, we got an office, we drive separately. We have separate schedules. We don't see each other during the day. We don't have our walks as normal. You know, we call each other. We'll be talking on the phone. We're like, dude, I like really want to see you. I feel like it's like when we're dating again, where it's like, I don't get to see you. And there's like this weird attraction. I just like, can't wait to see you, you know? And we were talked about, we're like, oh, that's it. Again, we're talking within the frame of like, there's a lot of distance. I was yeah. like, at the same time, I'd like a little more. Like, can we go on our walk during our lunch break? He's like, sure, you know? <laughs> and so I think um, it gives a great frame because it talks about how that's never going to be perfect. Hmm. It's never going to feel like, life is fluid and relationships are too. There's going to be periods where you feel very close and almost like you're on top of each other. And there's going to be periods where you feel like you're too distant and it's like you're drifting away. And it's just the ability to acknowledge when one is happening and then say, okay, is this a season that we're going to be in for a moment and it's going to go back to you know feeling like a pace we like better? Or do we need to do something because there's no end in sight? Yeah. And so... It's just given us great language to use with each other. I feel like that's the biggest thing is like when, because when you're using the wrong language, it will just come across wrong. You know, like if you're just saying, oh, I need more yeah. space. It's like, oh, well, is the other person doing something wrong? Are they yeah. in your stuff? When it's not that necessarily, there's maybe a different sort of, yeah, language to use around this that just normalizes it a bit more and makes it something yeah. that you're both on the same team. Yeah, because similar to you, yeah, me and my girlfriend work together too. She's the creative director of everything that I do, so... Yeah, you're definitely, you know, we're around each other all the time. And yeah. when you get that language wrong around balance, like it just can lead to sticky situations that really neither of us intend to have. So, Oh, 100%. Yeah. But I mean, you're around anyone long enough, you're sick of them. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? It's totally normal. <laughs> well, um, no, I appreciate the insights and all. Um, Got to go check out that book, Mating Captivity, but not the weird parts. <laughs> yeah, not the weird parts. <laughs> well, it's cool. been good chopping it up. And I appreciate uh, you being so open with everything. I appreciate you sharing your journey over the years. It's uh, been amazing learning from you really inspired by you um, and excited to see what you do in 2024 and wishing you all the best and thanks for your time. I appreciate it, dude. Thank you for having me on. Thank you.